Dude! 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 Wow! What a movie! Hello, ladies and gents. Welcome to the newest episode of Moff's Movie Show. I'm your host, as always, a financial contributor and cog to the Marvel money-making machine. And today, we're going to talk about Spider-Man No Way Home, my official thoughts. I'll be talking about spoiler-free now, and I'll say when I'm going to talk about spoilers, but I gotta, talk, I gotta speak from the heart, no notes, no bullet points, no nothing. I was surprised by how much I was taken aback by this emotionally. I have not been the biggest fan of the Tom Holland movies. I have enjoyed them. So when I went into this, I was expecting a mess, but a fun time, and maybe some cool things to happen that have been rumored on the internet. And coming out, I was, more than anything, I was surprised the most by how much I cared about Tom Holland's world. At the end of the last movie, the villain of that movie, Far From Home Mysterio, reveals to the world that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So now everybody knows that he's Spider-Man, and it's causing so much trouble in his life. It's ruining everybody's lives. So he goes to Doctor Strange. This is all in the trailer, by the way. He goes to Doctor Strange and asks him to cast a spell that will let everybody forget that he is Spider-Man. But then he kind of gets naive, and he asks questions while he's casting the spell, and it causes a whole rift, causing characters from other Spider-Man worlds and universes to show up in Tom Holland's universe. And that's where things get cray-cray. I was cautiously optimistic for Spider-Man No Way Home. I had every reason to be, I feel like, because bringing in the Spider-Verse into live action is a dubious decision. The Into the Spider-Verse, the animated one, is a perfect movie, a perfect Spider-Man movie. And to like kind of take that magic and try to re replicate it and emulate that and do something with that in live action, it's a risky move. And for it being the end movie for Tom Holland, for the third movie... um. You're bringing a lot of nostalgia beans in, or member berries, you know? So, it's, I think it's warranted to be worrisome, because especially if you grew up with Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's movies, then you kind of, like, if they're going to bring these characters in, the villains anyway, you're like, you're going to, you want them to do right by those characters, and also tell a story that works for Tom Holland's character, because, in my opinion, he hasn't been getting the shaft as Peter Parker, but just this iteration has just been splitting screen time with, characters from the Marvel Cinematic Universe and in my opinion it, we've had lighthearted but and some dramatic moments in these movies but they don't they didn't feel like proper Spider-Man stories to me this is all my opinion by the way if you love the movie if you love Tom Holland's movies fantastic awesome but I'm, I'm this is how I feel personally I'm one person talking about Spider-Man but this for me is the first time that I genuinely cared about Tom Holland's character as Peter Parker. The pressure that Peter Parker as a character takes on, being an everyday kid burdened with such heavy responsibility, these movies never really hit, captured that for me until now. I was crying at multiple scenes. I got very emotional, not just for certain things with the nostalgia of the past, but also with Tom Holland's character, what they do with him in this movie. Tom Holland's arc in this really hit uh, Michael Giacchino's score. He's been doing the score and the music for the past two movies too. That theme is a good theme, but it really hits here. He takes that theme that he created and these little motifs and cranks it up to 11 when it matters, and it really elevates the scenes where he really goes crazy with that score and the opera and the vocals. It's It was unbelievable. I enjoyed and I had fun with the first half of this movie, but there's a turning point and... Is a very distinct turning point. If you've seen the movie, it's a particular scene, and it involves one of Peter Parker's superpowers. And that was the moment where, looking back at it, that's where it really turns into the movie that I ended up loving. And from there on out, I was fully invested in this. From there on out, there are scenes that I just couldn't contain myself. I watched this movie twice so far. The first time, I was just so overwhelmed, but the second time, I was just, my eyes were always wet. My eyes were always on the verge of sinking tears. It was unbelievable. What they build towards with this movie is just beautiful, and it just worked for Peter Parker as a character, and it kind of recontextualizes how I feel about Tom Holland's character throughout all these movies, both the ones that he appeared in, like Civil War and Infinity War and Endgame, and his actual movies. And the last, like literally the last two to three scenes of this movie hit one after the other like a freight train and 
uh, some of the best Spider-Man moments that I've ever seen in movie in the movie so far. I couldn't believe how much I loved what they did with his character by the end of this movie. And then the actual ending, I've been replaying in my head over and over again. There are more than a handful of moments where they really lean into the humor and they feel like they have this really good joke on their hands and the joke just falls completely flat and it makes that moment really awkward. Um, I think it's also really messy in terms of the plot and elements of that plot. You just kind of suspend disbelief for a lot of these things. They don't really explain. So you've seen the trailer. Green Goblin, Dr. Octopus, a lot of these villains show up from other Spider-Man universes and they don't, they explain it, but they don't really explain it. And then further on in the movie, other things happen and they don't, they don't explain those things either. You just gotta have to go with it. These characters are there in service of a, of a f- actual story, which I, it's fan service, but it's, they're using the fan service to still tell a story that at, at the end of the day revolves and centers on Tom Holland's character and the story that they are telling does emotionally work. It changes Tom Holland as a character. He learns from his experiences and he comes forward as a new person, as a reborn person. And it's really, it's uplifting, but it's also depressing and sad and dark. And you're feeling all these twists of emotions. But again, you got to really suspend your disbelief for a lot of the elements of the plot. Because if you think too hard about certain things, it's going to detract from your enjoyment. And your experience. It is truly a celebration of 20 years of cinematic Spider-Man. And you have to get... If you can get through this first hour, if you're not really enjoying the movie for the first hour or so, I think it's worth it to get to when things get really serious and when things get truly insane. That's when the movie really finds its identity for me and really becomes what I think is one of the strongest Spider-Man stories in cinematic history so far. It leans heavy into nostalgia, but it's nostalgia done correctly at least for me when it comes to a time we're living in now where it's very ubiquitous and easy to quick to cash a quick check and make a movie that really leans into what people loved about ips that they grew up with but i think this is one of the ones that does that pitch and concept right and even after what i just said about that i think even still consistently throughout this movie it we are centered on Tom Holland. We are centered on Spider-Man and Peter Parker and what he's going through. From the very beginning, the focus is on Peter Parker. One last thing before I get into spoilers. A lot of Tom Holland's iteration of Peter Parker, the MCU version of Peter Parker, very naive. He's a young kid. He's in high school and he's still, he's been Spider-Man for a little bit, but he's, but you got to keep in mind that he is especially compared to Toby and Andrew. He is a kid throughout his tenure as Spidey. Tom Holland's character would make a lot of these shallow and naive decisions because he's a kid and he would suffer consequences, but it was, it's more like when you like disobey your mother and you take a cookie from the cookie jar and then she just like slaps your wrist like bad. Shame on you. Shame on you. Being Spider-Man sucks. It really does. And this is the first time where it really feels like Peter Parker is starting to understand the weight of the situations that he's putting himself and others in. Like, oh, Josh Golly. This is all my fault. But ultimately, No Way Home is a nice trilogy capper. It's very satisfying. It's emotionally resonant. The music is beautiful. The last half of this movie ends so strongly. And the things that happen in this movie, I think the elements that they introduce with the villains and what happens afterwards, they're done right. This movie does a really good job of capturing the essence of the character while also telling a story that could, it is messy and it is really silly inherently, but it, it knows that, but it also takes advantage of that and tells a story that really rebirths Peter Parker into a role that, going forward, makes for some very exciting times. And I'm just happy to finally be on board with where we are with this new character and this new iteration of Spidey, because I've just been passively enjoying his character, more so as a side character in the bigger Avengers movies, but now now I'm excited for what comes next. All in all, though, this is the first Spider-Man Tom Holland movie that I love. It took three movies to get to this emotionally for me, and it's not just because of the nostalgias. It's not just because of that. They actually told an impactful story with Tom Holland, and I'm grateful that the story they told here 
hits as hard as it does. And the only other Spider-Man movies that have been able to do that for me, at least where I feel like I'm about to get really emotional, are Amazing Spider-Man 2 and Into the Spider-Verse. And for me, that's great company. <laughs> and now we're going to talk about spoilers. And I know I've been going on really long already, so I'm going to try to keep this as quick as possible because there's so much to talk about in this movie. But if you haven't seen the movie yet, obviously leave mom and dad, family, anybody who's watching this who I know is probably watching this right now. If you haven't watched the movie yet, don't watch this part. Uh, watch the movie first, then come back and let's have a discussion. Without further ado, let's talk about it. Are they gone? Are they gone? Okay. Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are in this movie. The way they're introduced here with Ned and MJ conjuring them with the portals, and they're just like, it's the way it's done, it's so funny. And then Ned's grandmother asking them to like do chores around the house and help clean the house. Uh, it, it's a really, it was a very unexpected way to see them come into the fold. And then after that, like, because this whole movie is fun. Doc Ock, Green Goblin, and all these villains show up, and he's like, uh, Tom Holland's trying to capture them with the little device that brings him to Doctor Strange's dungeon, the prison, whatever. And then we get to the condo, which is when he brings all the villains to the condo, it's funny. Him working with the villains to create these these cures to save them because he's trying to save these villains was endearing. But then when Green Goblin takes the turn and when Peter Parker gets the spider sense that something is wrong, that's the part where for me with the movie, that's the turning point where I start loving the movie. The way they capture the spider sense with the vertigo shot, with the jaw shot, love that. And then the fight that ensues with Green Goblin and Spidey and then Aunt May's death is one of the best scenes I've seen in any Spider-Man movie. And I really, it's a lot of that is contributed to the way they draw out Aunt May's death. Like, she gets hit by that glider hard. So you're thinking, like, she's dead. And then the, the pumping bomb, the pumping bomb explodes in the same room after that. And you're like, okay, she's definitely dead. And then she gets up, and you're like, huh? And then she slow, like, she's, she's gasping for breath, and then she slowly but surely passes. And Tom Holland's acting in this scene is truly heartbreaking stuff. It's probably the best acting he's done in these movies by far. And then you cut to the next scene there where he's standing in the rain in front of J.J. Jonah um, talking about the tragedy that unfolds and wherever Spider-Man shows calamity ensues, blah, 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 with the rain, great shot there. And then we get Toby and Andrew showing up and then we get the rooftop scene at the school where the three of them meet together and they talk about who they've lost in their lives, Uncle Ben, Gwen Stacy, and Aunt May, respectively. And then we get the scene of them being scientists, and then we get them collaborating and teamwork there, and then we get the Statue of Liberty scene, which is the ending fight scene. I am just going off right now, and I'm not breathing, and I'm sorry if it's, like, overwhelming you, but this is how it felt watching the movie. It's just, it felt literally, the first time I watched this movie, it felt like when we got to the point where Andrew and Toby showed up, it felt like a dream. I, I, the whole time coming home from the movie, I thought maybe I was going to wake up. You know what I mean? It was just weird. And the second time I watched the movie, it really just confirmed for me that the way they utilize these characters in this story worked. Because, yes, they show up out of nowhere, and yes, they don't really explain how they got to where they are. They just kind of, I guess they just poof, we're, we're in the new universe now. But the way they use them to help Peter cope with the loss of his aunt, and the way they use those characters to help emphasize to Peter Parker, our Peter Parker, Tom Holland what it really means to be the, the character of Spider-Man. Because at this point, for me, at least anyway, I, he's not really Spider-Man yet. He's still learning how to get to that point. And by the end of the movie, when we see him in this really awesome, beautiful, classic-looking suit, and he's just swinging through the streets in Rockefeller Center on top of the rock in the snow with the tree, it's so beautiful. Between the moment where he's talking to Zendaya at the coffee shop where he's going to try to make her remember who he is, but then he decides, you know what, nah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, you can interpret it as I'm going to let this happen organically, or I'm going to leave her alone because it's just nice to see her and my best friend, even though they forgot who I am, I'm just going to leave this be. That's when I realized in my head, okay, I believe this character in this role now. He is now Spider-Man to me. Him saying goodbye to Toby and Andrew was really sweet, but him saying goodbye to Zendaya and Jacob Batalon was that that scene made me cry. I wasn't ready for that. The Michael G. Kino score in the background was so amazing, no pun intended, and 
that was such an emotionally resonant moment. And I've never, I never thought I would feel that way with those particular characters. Or they also did a really good job of establishing their friendship and their bond in this movie. So that when we get to that point where he is making that sacrifice of making everybody forget who he is so that the world could be at peace again, it really hits home. We got freaking Daredevil in this movie. He shows up for like three seconds for like one scene. People were really endeared by his character in the Netflix show to have him back in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Tight. It's tight. And what I was saying before about the first half not being as strong as the second half, uh, it's not bad, but it just reminded me of what we've seen in the past couple of movies. Him going to Doctor Strange, him starting to capture these villains. It was all cute for me, but it wasn't It wasn't hitting impactfully the way, starting from the moment where Green Goblin turns and Aunt May dies, that from those moments are when the movie starts to really like hit its stride. Another scene I've been thinking about a lot is the the fight between Spidey and Doctor Strange. And I, one thing, one particular aspect of that scene that I keep thinking about is the music. Again, Michael Giacchino. Like, he went so hard on this movie. It's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. I haven't seen anybody else talk about this, and I don't know if this is just me, but so the entire, a lot of, the characterization of Peter Parker in this is that he wants to be an Avenger. He looked up to Robert Downey Jr., Tony Stark, and he was like a mentor to him. He was like almost like an Uncle Ben figure in this MCU world. So at the end of the movie, this the, the big fight scene takes place at the Statue of Liberty, which has, the they're constructing the Captain America shield on it. And I don't know why I'm interpreting this this way, and I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but I kind of, you can interpret Lady Liberty as Peter Parker, looking up to being, like, a member of the Avengers. And by the end of the fight, the Captain America shield has been taken off of Lady Liberty's arm. The scaffolding has all fallen apart, and at the end of the action scene, when all this is said and done, it's just Lady Liberty again. So it's almost like this movie, which is also doing the same thing of stripping Peter Parker of those Avengers elements because he's starting to come into his own and becoming truly spider-man he's literally on his own at the end of this movie he has nobody he's living in this apartment by himself swinging around the streets looking for crime and getting ready for college that final fight scene though seeing peter parker tom holland channel his inner anger though like emperor style with um green goblin like, like being like yeah that a boy yeah get angry kill me do it <laughs> it was scary watching him just punch green goblin over and over and over and over again and you could see in Toby and Andrew's eyes that, yeah, we gotta stop, we gotta, like, you were just saying, Andrew Garfield, that you let yourself become rageful in your tenure as Spidey after the events of Spider-Man 2. So, Toby McGuire is the one who initiates and goes, hey, listen, you're literally about to stab this guy, it's, you're never gonna come back from this, don't kill this dude. And then he proceeds to get stabbed, and everybody, including me, thought, oh, is Toby McGuire about to die? <laughs> but I really enjoyed watching Tom Holland in both the condominium fight scene and in this scene, just being the crap out of Green Goblin. In the former, as he's doing it, it's kind of like Joker style where he's punching him, but Green Goblin is just enjoying the hell out of it and just laughing in his face with that crazy look in his eyes as he's getting punched. A lot of people speculated this happening too, but the moment where Zendaya falls off the scaffolding and you see it in the trailers where Tom Holland's about to jump and dive after her and then he gets picked off by the Goblin, that's when... At least that, in that literal moment, then you see Andrew Garfield scream and run after her. And then he saves her. And he has like a little brief emotional beat where he starts getting a little emotional. And he goes, are you okay? Then Dea goes, yeah, are you okay? And then Andrew Garfield has a moment where you know he's thinking about Gwen Stacy. That killed me. Andrew Garfield's acting in that moment killed me. What also killed me, which is what I mentioned before, was when they were on the school rooftop. And he was talking about how at the end of Amazing Spider-Man 2... It was this really inspiring moment of him coming back to becoming Spidey after, I assume, months of not being Spidey because of what he did in accidentally killing his girlfriend. But I guess after that, things just probably took a turn for the worse because he mentions how he stopped pulling his punches and he got rageful. And you see in his face that Andrew Garfield's such a great actor. The way he winces when he's, ta when he's talking about this stuff, you're like, ooh. I heard about it. <laughs> and I did see it. And it's a Photoshop. I like that we got to see development with him and Toby learning a little bit about what happened to them after the events of their movies. 
I'm glad that Tobey Maguire and Kirsten Dunst are okay in their world too, that they made their relationship work. I can keep going on and on, but I'm not because I know this video is long. So I'm going to spare you. If you guys are still here, thank you for still being here. I really appreciate it, but I'm going to stop here. This is going on so long. Thank you to anybody who watched this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your support. This has been a lot of fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. I want to know in the comment section down below, what did you think of Spider-Man No Way Home? Do you think it was a strong entry into the whole Spider-Man Cinematic Universe like I did? Do you think it's the best Tom Holland movie like I did? Or do you disagree? Do you think it was a bad movie? Do you think they they did a weird job with executing this story? Um, do you feel like How do you feel about Tom Holland moving forward into what's, I guess, is going to be a new trilogy? One last thing. I would like a break from these Tom Holland Spideys. The way this movie ends... I don't need to see another one for a few years. Let these actors grow up a little bit. Let them take a time away from this universe and then bring it back in like five, six years. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we'll probably have a new Spider-Man by 2023, 2024. But that's the way it is. That's the way it goes. You don't really know what's going to happen with these actors on a given day. But they all seem committed. I could have sworn I saw Craven the Hunter when the multiverse rifts were opening. The second time I noticed it. There was a guy, a tall guy with a spear and a vest on that had to be Craven. Let's bring Craven into Spider-Man 4. That was supposed to be the original story and plot line for Spider-Man 3. Let's bring him in this time. Let's fucking finally do it. <laughs> but again, thank you guys for tuning in here. If you haven't already and you enjoyed watching me talk about Spidey, you could like the video, you could subscribe, and you could comment down below. And check out my Instagrams, my Twitters, and my letterbox where I'm always logging in new movies now and i have a lot of fun on letterboxd uh but yeah thank you for stopping by thank you for tuning in i really appreciate it and it's i'm just glad we got a really satisfying spidey movie i'm in heaven right now i really felt like i was dreaming but thank you again for tuning in i'll see you guys next time have a great week stay safe omnicron seems to be spreading like wildfire so if you're going to the movies wear a mask be careful be safe have a good holiday and i'll see you next week Take care. Love all y'all. Bye-bye.